people. Um, all right. So Wired to Eat. Okay. First of all, I loved, I loved all of the juicy nuggets that you were sharing in this book. And um, I've been, I've been on my own paleo journey for five or six years now. And there have been so many different hacks that I've tried. Here's all this book, y'all. Hacks that I've tried and different things that I've done to figure out my own N equals one. Like many women, I have hormone issues. Um, I was a I was a runner. I was a half marathoner, adding insult to injury to my body and not knowing that I was doing that. And um, I'm an entrepreneur, achiever. So in every, I was doing everything I could to make sure my cortisol was as jacked as it could be. Right. <laughs> And so, um, so I've tried a, a lot of different things and, you know, did a lot more than eat. I know a lot of people, this is paleo awareness month. Um, as you guys know, if you're, um, obviously on Facebook, you, you've seen us promoting it all month long. So we've been talking about, um, what it means to be paleo and what the paleo diet's all about. And the thing that really struck me about all things paleo, when I first started my own journey was that it was so much more than food. And you actually touch on this a little bit in the book. Um, and I especially wanted to kind of talk a little bit about sleep because I think that's such an important part of um, being able to reclaim your health at any level. And it hasn't gotten as much airtime as some of the other ideas in our movement that are that are all good. Um, but sleep is so hugely important. That was one of the first things that I had to fix. I was the chronic up till 2 a.m. From probably 18 to 36, I was up until 2 a.m at least every night or later. And, um, you know, just another thing to like, screw. I, 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 my entire lifestyle was meant to like F me over basically. So, um, so I, there's a lot, there's a lot more to being paleo than just the diet, you know? So we, we talk about things like sleep and we talk about your circadian biology and we talk about getting a lot of sunlight and what's the environment that you're in and what kind of EMFs are you exposed to and all these other conditions that, affect your body's ability to reclaim its health. And you talk about sleep a lot in the book and you talk about some of these other factors. So I think it would be fun just to start out not talking about food because I know that's where we're going to end up because I really think these other dimensions or aspects of the conversation are so important to being able to um, to heal and correct what's going on. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, the sleep piece, um, I, I could have probably made an argument that 99% of the book could be built around sleep and circadian rhythm, but uh, I don't think that time is quite yet to have a mainstream publisher really wrap their arms around that. I know uh, Ariana Huffington did a, a sleep book that actually did pretty well, but um, you know, we, people are so fixated on food, and oftentimes the food is kind of the lever that they, they start playing with first, but the uh, sleep and circadian rhythm piece really are – non-negotiable elements of this whole story and it will buy you a lot more latitude on the food uh, with regards to your health to your body composition so yeah i mean it's really hard to understate how important that is so when you think about when you talk about sleep like what is your experience um on the sleep side and what are some things that you think are really important for people to know or understand as it relates to how they're managing their sleep yeah i mean if trying to get as much as is reasonable, although we see pathology both at the really short end of the sleep cycle and at the really long end of the sleep cycle. You know, like depression can manifest both in short and longer periods of sleep than what would normally uh, be healthy. But the, one of the big factors is just going to bed earlier, you know, and that will change a little bit throughout the seasons. But in general, once the sun goes down, you know, we start dimming the lights in the house, maybe put on some blue blockers have a go-to-bed ritual, uh, start minimizing our use of iPhones and iPads and, and uh, you know, computers and whatnot so that we can get into kind of a, a lower uh, stimulation state and definitely reducing that blue light that gets into our eyes, which tends to suppress melatonin production and can keep us awake longer. Mm -hmm. So when you think about other conditions besides besides food that are really important. Um, what are some other things that come to mind as really important qualities to, um, for people to consider when mitigating some of their health challenges? Yeah. I mean, in the book and, and just kind of for, for years, really, I've broke this down into what I consider the four pillars, which are sleep and photo period, food, movement, and community. And so that community piece is another huge element and that's part of how you know i think that we've had the success that we've had within this 
paleoancestral health scene is that a community is an indispensable part of human nature and human health and figuring out ways to cultivate healthy relationships and having community is really important. We don't know the exact reasons why, but people who have inadequate social connectivity have as increased a likelihood of death and illness as a pack a day smoker. So, it, you know, the community piece is really huge. And I would argue this is a lot of why we see such um, stickiness with things like CrossFit and MoveNet, where if you have a well run gym or a well run program, the coach is going to talk about sleep and photo period. We're going to recommend some some smart ways of eating, usually around this kind of paleo ancestral health template. You get the exercise, and then baked into the cake with that is this whole community experience. So yeah, the, it, you know, the, to the degree that you can kind of multitask on that stuff, then it's a really nice fit. Yeah, and I think the community thing is why Paleo FX has been so successful over the last you know six years is because just being able to come together and talk about these ideas that aren't mainstream. Um, right, and right. and be able to share and hear from other like-minded people does so much to strengthen your resolve and give you new tools and feel like you're a part of something that's bigger than just your own personal journey, which is really powerful. Right, right. So I want to read um, just this description of the book. For those of you who aren't familiar with Rob Wolf's, Wolf's book, Wired to Eat, um, it explains how more willpower and better discipline are not the missing pieces to health and fat loss. Our genetics are working against us in the modern world of super tasty foods. In this new book, you'll learn about neuroregulation of the appetite and how hyperpalpable foods can bypass our built-in off switch, causing us to eat far more than we otherwise would. The genes that made our ancestors successful are setting us up for troubles today. You will learn how, to, how sleep, gut health, stress, exercise, and community can work with or against our goals of health and leanness. So... Let's talk a little bit about the Whiteman Institute study that um, that you mentioned in the book and I heard in a couple of your interviews that kind of offer a really great frame for this whole conversation. Yeah, you know, it, the study was fascinating. It was released in Cell, which is a pretty prestigious journal, I believe, two years ago. And what they did is they took 800 people, which is a really nice large sample size, they fitted these folks with a continuous blood glucose monitor, which checked their blood glucose once a minute for the duration of the study, which was two weeks. And they did a full gut microbiome sequencing on these folks. They did a genetic test on them. They did some pretty extensive blood work. And then they started feeding these folks different types of meals. And what they found was that the blood glucose response was just all over the map. There really wasn't any consistent uh, you know, response some people would eat white rice and see a remarkably high blood glucose level. Other people would eat white rice, and it was like they had a glass of water. It barely moved their blood glucose at all. And they were able to use some machine learning algorithms to put the blood glucose response in context with both the gut microbiome and the genetics and basically form a way of, of predicting how people would respond to this process. But at the end of the day, we can really figure a lot of this stuff out by just simply doing a, a very simple uh, seven day or longer if you want to. I pick seven days because folks get intimidated if you throw out too long of a test period. But a seven day carb test where each day in the morning they eat a specific amount of carbohydrate with a, a uh, uh, 50 grams of effective carbs. This is the you know carbs minus the fiber. And you check your blood glucose two hours later. And I put some pretty tight boundaries on where that blood glucose should go um, that is very different and much more conservative than what you would see in mainstream medical recommendations, but is what we saw in uh, non-Westernized peoples and hunter-gatherers that were given an oral glucose tolerance test, and they responded very, very well to that. They had really, really remarkable um, uh, ability to handle that glucose load. And so it, it's a little bit arbitrary, but I think it's a, a pretty good benchmark and a more conservative benchmark to help people keep those blood glucose levels within ranges that seem to be a lot more consistent with long-term health. So you you say that the two main variables here that, that you've kind of deduced um, from these studies that affect um, our glucose levels are genetics and the health of the gut. Appears to be. Yeah. Appears yeah. to be. Appears to be. So I was a little bit surprised. I wasn't surprised by the genetics, but the health of the gut was a little bit 
I don't know, surprising is the word. It was a really interesting way to consider this whole this whole issue of of you know glucose and insulin sensitivity and all of that kind of stuff. Um, talk to us a little bit about how the gut interacts with the body to uh, basically affect these levels so severely in us. Yeah, I mean, we are just now starting to learn what's going on in this story, and we have learned more in the last five years than we knew in the previous 50 years. And the next couple of years is just going to be crazy, the amount of information that we pull out of this story. But what we seem to see is a certain profile that seems to be pretty consistent with insulin sensitivity, low intestinal permeability, low inflammation, and that all seems to be pretty good. And then on the flip side of that, we seem to see a profile of a certain gut bacteria that tend to be pro-inflammatory, may increase intestinal permeability, and that definitely negatively impacts our insulin sensitivity and our, our kind of glucose tolerance. So, it, it, but even that that said, um, these things are kind of trends. Like there are a lot of people out there that are saying, "Oh, this is the one." strain that is the most important, you know, like a bifidum strain or acromantia or something like that. And it's interesting, you know, we have examples of really, really healthy people that have shockingly different gut microbiomes, like uh, analysis of the Hudza, they contain gut microbes that we don't see at all in westernized populations. Yet we see westernized populations that are reasonably healthy and they, they have like all these lactobacilli organisms, which the, the uh, Hudsa don't really have any of those. So I, I think that it's still really premature to be able to say that we can simply sequence this stuff and immediately predict what's, what's going on. But it, we do know that one of the interesting findings that came out of this Weizmann Institute research was that if people keep their blood glucose on average within pretty good boundaries, we tend to see the gut microbiome shift towards what we generally consider to be a more favorable profile. And we also tend to see decreased inflammatory markers, better glucose disposal, better insulin sensitivity. So it's still very much in a, a uh, uh, empirical process. Mm -hmm. We need to experiment with it. We're not yet at a spot where we can be scanned and, you know, just, just recommended a dietary approach. Oh. Like that. It's going to be great when, when we finally get to the point where someday, <laughs> right, someday, yeah. right. After we've aggregated all this data and, and studied it, um, 30 to 50% of the U S population, according to your book shows signs of insulin resistance and or metabolic syndrome, 30 to 50%. Those are pretty steep statistics. So this yeah. is, this is an area that kind of, it's relevant to all of us and it touches all of us. And I'd love for you just to kind of, just talk a little bit about the way this is showing up in our lives, you know, um, the way it's showing up and as, as we try different aspects of the diet, you know, you wrote the paleo solution in 2010. And one of the things I love about you is you hold everything is so provisional, you know, you're constantly reevaluating your own thinking and looking at your biases and asking hard questions. Like I'd love for you to kind of just connect all this into how your thinking has been changing over the last seven years about this stuff. Yeah, you know, it's interesting because we had this renal risk assessment program, which was uh, a risk analysis that was looking at police and firefighters. We found 35 people at high risk for type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease, put them on a paleo diet, modified their sleep and exercise. And based off the changes in their health risk assessment parameters and their blood work, it was uh, uh, estimated that the savings to the city of Reno was north of $22 million with a 33 to one return on investment. So really impressive stuff. And so, you know, that, that, I, I, that, that study wrapped up five, almost six years ago. And what it told me is this ancestral health template is incredibly powerful. But then at the same time, some of this understanding of the personalized nutrition story, you know, we could make a statement of eat whole unprocessed foods, and that, that seems totally reasonable, and it's a great place to start, folks. But then this individualized testing is really fascinating because within that, you know, that term, whole unprocessed foods, you could have rice, you could have potatoes, you could have sweet potatoes, you could have beans. You know, there's all kinds of paleo and non-paleo foods that could fit into that. It's interesting because when I tested myself, Things like white rice, white potatoes, even sweet potatoes, if I ate too much of it, 
it would get my blood sugar into near or above diabetic levels. And I felt terrible as a consequence. Mm -hmm. My wife, by contrast, ate exactly the same foods, ate the same amount of foods, and her blood glucose response was 50 to 70 times better than mine was. And uh, it, it one, one side note with that is that there are a lot of folks out in the, the paleo low-carb world that cannot wrap their head around the fact that there are people like my wife who are metabolically healthy, who, who can eat decent amounts of carbs, and they're never going to become type 2 diabetic. They're never going to develop Parkinson's or Alzheimer's. They are just wired up in a different way. Their, their metabolism can handle a modest amount of carbs. I mean, you know, she wasn't eating huge amounts, so she handled it far better than I could. Right. But as, you know, as powerful as this paleo diet template is, and it's a great starting point, even within that beginning point, I could easily eat amounts and types of carbs that could still push me into diabetic blood sugar ranges and would be really problematic for me over the long haul. So again, you know, we, I, I really don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. This paleo ancestral health template is amazing as a starting point, but we need to be really good about not turning it into a, uh, a set of religious doctrine and remembering that there are lots of uh, nuance and caveats that we need to spend a little bit of time exploring. Right. So in your book, you outline kind of two phases to basically a framework for exploring all mm -hmm. of this and kind of where you fall in the spectrum. Why don't you um, kind of walk us through what those two phases look like? And I just want to invite everyone to drop your um, questions into the chat. I'm having Benjamin pull those together for me. And um, we're going to spend the last half of this hour long interview asking Rob your questions. So make sure you drop your questions in. Um, and I also want to mention before you start unpacking this, Rob, that today is the last day of the flash sale for Paleo FX. So if you've been thinking about getting your ticket um, or tickets to Paleo FX this year, um, today's the last day of the flash sale. And if you go to paleofx.com forward slash register, you can get your tickets um, to the conference um, in May where Rob will be there speaking along with a lot of our a lot of our other awesome Paleo FX speakers. So um Comments, uh, questions, drop them in the chat. And Rob, why don't you tell us about these two phases here? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm pretty uh, pretty tickled with how all of that turned out. And this is some stuff that we learned working in the clinic and trying to help people move through this whole process. But the, the book does a really good job of helping people to move through a triage process where we get a really good sense of where one is on this insulin sensitivity, insulin resistance spectrum. And so we start with subjective elements like how do you feel between meals, what's your, you know, uh, your cognitive clarity and whatnot. And then we get more granular and specific and look at things like waist to hip measurements and uh, A1C, fasting glucose. We also use some advanced testing, like recommend use of advanced testing, like the LPIR score, the lipoprotein insulin resistance score. People do sometimes rely on uh, measurements like the triglyceride to HDL ratio, which can give you a sense of insulin resistance or insulin sensitivity. But what we found in the clinic is about 40 to 60 percent of people are miscategorized with this. People who are insulin resistant are actually missed. And these are the people that are discordant. They tend to have high lipoproteins, comparatively low cholesterol levels. And these are the people that are, appear to be the, the most highly at risk for developing cardiovascular disease. So I walk people through this process of triage, and depending on where they play out with that, I give a spectrum of about 75 to 150 grams of carbs a day. If you're more insulin sensitive, then you start on the higher end of the, the carb intake. If you're more insulin resistant, you start a little bit on the lower side, and we motor forward for 30 days, and hopefully what this process does is help rewire the appetite, normalize the neuroregulation of appetite, we heal the gut, we reduce inflammation, we improve insulin sensitivity. And then on the heels of that, we kind of stress test this whole system. We do a seven-day carb test where we pick a battery of carbs that we're going to evaluate. We do that in the morning because we're trying to control as many variables as possible. So the person wakes up, you know, has their coffee, goes poo, does whatever they do, and then they jump into the, the test. And with this, we are testing in a really controlled and, and really, in some ways, non-ideal fashion, like you can mitigate blood glucose response by adding protein and fiber to meals, by taking some vinegar before the meal and stuff like that. That's all great mitigated strategy. But I want to know specifically what are the foods you do well with and what are the foods that you do poorly with? And then we start 
determining mitigated strategies. Mm-hmm. It's also worth mentioning that in the book, we have four different meal plans based off of where you play out in the, the triage process. One meal plan is kind of a, a very standard paleo type approach. The other one is an autoimmune paleo approach. We also have a transitional keto diet approach, which is the use of a low glycemic load diet plus ample amounts of MCT oil to create a, a low level of nutritional ketosis. And then finally, a nutritional ketosis uh, meal plan. And again, I help people to navigate moving through this whole thing so so that they can figure out which plan is the appropriate one for them. Mm-hmm. So we're getting lots and lots of questions from the community, and I just want to oh, co- jump in on that. Yeah, I, jump in on the questions. I want yeah. to serve up a few and of I'm these. Grab a bottle of water. I'll be, I'll be back in two shakes. Okay, one that sounds good. If you guys have questions for Rob, go ahead and drop them into the comments. We're seeing quite a few questions come through. Some of these questions, I feel like Rob kind of dealt with a little bit. So we'll start with the ones that um, are are you know haven't been haven't been touched on yet. So um, Catherine asks in the book. You reference a daily carb intake of 100 to 150 grams of carbs. Is that total or effective carbs? And it probably would be helpful for you to kind of explain how people actually calculate the net carbs. Yeah, it's effective carbs or net carbs. I mean, this is the metabolically available carbs that are going to hit our pancreas, our bloodstream. So in the way that you calculate that, in in the book, I, I provided a pretty extensive list with the amounts and, and types of carbs that, you know, uh, basically accounts for how much starch or sugars minus the fiber. And and so that's the way that you calculate that. And what, what you find is that if you're eating kind of a whole food based paleo esque type approach, it's pretty damn hard to hit those levels. Like it, it's a very, um, it's a very forgiving way of doing this, particularly if you're sticking with stuff like squash and carrots and, and lower glycemic load options. Awesome. All right. We've got another question here from Chu who asks, how often do you recommend doing testing periods and how often should you do a 30 day reset and a seven day carb test? That's actually an an interesting question. Is this something that you just do seven days then 30 days or do you need to cycle this a few times? Is your body going to change? So in the book, I have a short chapter called writing into the sunset, which is basically we've done this 30 day reset. We've done the seven day carb test. Now what the heck do we do? And at one level, we just take what we've learned and figure out what the kind of Pareto 80-20 rule is with that. Like, what's the easiest way that we can do that and get the maximum benefit, minimum cost to us? But over the course of time, people can change a lot. They, the, you know, a person that is insulin sensitive today, they may start doing police work or, or shift work or they may have a kid and that disordered circadian rhythm, the disordered sleep. Could dramatically impact their insulin sensitivity and so they may need to go back in and retool this whole thing and and use a 30-day reset and a seven-day carb test to re-establish where they are but a rough recommendation that i make in the book is that people kind of revisit this stuff quarterly and it's not necessarily that they have to do the full reset or the full carb test but they just you know almost programming it into their calendar you know, do a system analysis, like how do you look, how do you feel, how do you perform? And we do that, you know, quarterly or with the changes of the, the seasons or something like that. So that if we do start drifting, we don't let six months or a year happen so that we are really buried under a negative process. And it's going to be that much harder to get ourselves back. So that's a great question. And I definitely do address that in the book. Yeah. And you also address some of the basic tools that people are going to need to um, to be able to do the phase one and phase two of your plan. Do you want to just share what those tools are really quickly? Okay, say that again. You broke up just a minute. Yeah. The basic tools that you need to do phase one and phase two of your plan. I, I was looking in here at glucose meters, one of them. Um, but are there, are there things that people are going to need besides just, just the food? The, the glucose meter and then, you know, ideally for the 30 day reset, um, you are going to do some pretty good blood work. And it, it, it's, uh, you know, depending on where you get it, it, it may be 150 to $250, but I really, really strongly recommend that folks do that so that they establish a baseline. And again, this isn't something that, that blood work isn't something that you're going to need to do monthly. This is something that we use as a baseline. Maybe we recheck it six months or a year down the road. But I think that that, that particularly the way that we look at it within the, the framework of this risk assessment program, 
gives us a beautiful insight into your cardiovascular disease potential and your overall inflammatory state and perhaps most importantly your insulin sensitivity right so i do recommend that that triage blood work because it really sets you up for success because you know exactly where you are right so Benjamin asks, do you consider Wired to Eat a replacement for the paleo solution or a companion piece? Oh, man. I mean, it easily could be a replacement just because, it, you know, I uh, ho hopefully I've learned a little bit over the last seven years. You know? <laughs> right. So, it, and, you know, even though it, it's interesting because I do mention paleo and the paleo process in the in the book, uh, they ended up kind of pushing it into a sidebar piece, but it, it's still pretty effective, but I make the case that every single year, U.S. News and World Reports places paleo and Whole30 and everything like it, like this stuff as the dead last worst diet you could ever imagine eating. And they have things like Slim Fast and all these other things that are, are placed ahead of it. And so I just mention that and I actually go through and, and do a, what I think is a better argument for the paleo diet in this book than what I did in the, the paleo solution. But it, that's because now we have so many more human trials. So instead of it being a theoretical story, I was actually able to go human trial by human trial and build this really solid case starting from metabolic derangements. Even this, this fascinating study that was done at UCS, UCSF where they overfed people on a paleo diet. So it was hypercaloric. And they still saw improvements in their blood lipids, whereas the people that were in a hypercaloric, you know, standard American diet deal, all their metabolic parameters decreased. Now, I'm not recommending that you go and eat a hypercaloric paleo diet, you know, but, but the interesting thing was that just the food quality ended up improving blood lipids and inflammatory markers. So there's something very powerful about that, that paleo template again. Right. But there's also a lot of latitude. But, you know, I, I could easily make a, a, a case that you would get much more up to date and concrete clinical treatment of the paleo diet concept in Wired to Eat. Whereas with the paleo solution, we didn't have that many randomized control trials yet. We didn't have someone like Terry Walls who's done multiple interventions for room, rheumatoid arthritis and multiple sclerosis. Mm -hmm. Today we do. So we're able to rely on much more. Uh, uh, randomized control trials, which are really the gold standard for, for human medical tests. Right. Whereas in the first book, we were still relying on a lot more anecdote and a lot more theoretical framework. Right. It's amazing how far we've come in just really 10 years. It's, it's crazy where we are today. I love it. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Ryan asks, this book is a frame for weight loss, but it can be, fr can it be framed for hard charging athletes as well? I have been paleo for a couple years now and got myself into trouble doing keto and training hard for obstacle course racing. As part of my recovery, I'm in the process of trying to figure out how to integrate carbs back into my diet, both in types and amounts. Yeah, I mean, the elite athlete who is looking for what's the thing that's going to move the needle for them, I would say out of any population we could consider, wired to eat is probably the least likely to be, you know, like a, a, a huge game changer for that that individual because it is focused mainly on weight loss and health. Mm -hmm. I do mention athletics in there. I mean, but it's it's a couple of paragraphs. But the the interesting thing, though, all of that stuff said, and this is just trying to be dead honest. Like this thing is not a performance nutrition book. It, mm -hmm. it, it's just not. But you learn about insulin sensitivity and insulin resistance. You learn about the uh, inflammatory response, the importance of the gut microbiome. Uh, you know, all of the issues around circadian rhythm, all of that is critical for elite athletic performance. And really the thing that needs to be discovered then, which uh, uh, the, the person that wrote the question already alluded to, you need to figure out your carb ratio, really, that you need. You need to figure out the overall caloric intake, have your proteins appropriate, and then figure out if you are more fat or carbohydrate fueled. And this is the same problem that I've kind of faced fueling for Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu and, and CrossFit type stuff. Right. Uh, I know there are some people that seem to be able to do it kind of ketotic. I just can't do it. It just beats me down. But that said, I'm running 100, 150 grams a day of, of uh, carbohydrate, which is 20, 25 percent of, of total calories. And if I do that amount, I feel really good. I don't suffer the blood sugar swings that I, I get from higher carb intakes. 
but it's enough so that I'm able to motor through my, my really hard glycolytic workouts. Awesome. If you guys have a question for Rob, if you want to just go ahead and drop it into the comments, um, Benjamin is grabbing those for us and making sure that um, we're able to serve all those uh, questions up for him. And I just want to mention one more time that you can go check out paleofx.com forward slash to register to get your paleo FX tickets. Today is the last day of the flash sale. So I have a question here from Bill who asks, if you've been eating paleo, do you need to do the 30 day reset before doing the seven day carb testing? Not necessarily. It's a really good question, but it, it's, uh, um, that said, I do recommend doing the triage, which leads you into the 30 day test. So mm -hmm. even if you've been motoring long, eating paleo and you feel like you're, you're doing pretty well, I really strongly recommend doing that triage. And oftentimes what happens with that is that people are not quite as buttoned up as what they thought they were. The numbers may not be quite as good as what we would like to see. And then I would recommend plugging into the, the 30 day reset. But, you know, if you've been motoring along on a paleo diet, you're feeling good. I highly recommend doing the triage, which is basically built around the blood work and also the subjective observations about how you feel between meals, what your, your uh, cognitive function is. So, I mean, it's really worthwhile to set up that benchmark because uh, without that, then doing the seven-day carb test isn't quite as effective because you're not paying as close attention to the way that you feel between meals with your sleep, your exercise tolerance, and all that stuff. This seems to be a, a, a pattern in what a lot of our experts um, in the ancestral health space recommend and talk about is just how important it is to be tracking and really paying attention to your numbers and metrics so that you can dial in and figure out what's going on in your body. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, that it's, that's been a tough thing for me to come around to. I don't know if like being a biochemist in my past life, I weighed and measured every damn thing that I did. And so mm -hmm. I was just like, Oh my God, I'm, I'm done with it. And, uh, and I've also been really suspicious of the over the top quantified self stuff. I mean, people are just buried with data and people already get into analysis paralysis with just asking the question, high carb, low carb, or moderate carb. Right. I mean, that's enough to right. like, have you rock off the rails. Car, like, <laughs> making noises. So, um, so all that said, I've slowly added some of these quantified self things like blood glucose monitoring. What I've settled on, you know, like I don't necessarily recommend gut microbiome testing as part of the, the program. I don't necessarily recommend doing genetic testing as part of the program. You can find some interesting information with that, but at its current evolution, in my opinion, it's expensive and buries you under data that isn't going to change anything that you do clinically. Right. But if you do a seven day carb test, if you pay attention to your sleep, if you pay attention to your cognitive function, that will immediately give you feedback with regards to what you need to do. So I try to be really conservative in what quantified stuff that people pay attention to. And, and I really make a powerful case in the book that they just pay attention to how they feel. Right. You know, it's like, how do you feel between meals? Do you have great cognition? Are you clear headed? Are you foggy headed and kind of cranky and stuff like that? That is really, really valuable stuff. And you can't really find that on blood work. It might be a food intolerance. It might be intestinal permeability from small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. It can be 50 different things. But what we can figure out is that certain foods trigger it. And if we either avoid or mitigate those foods and opt into other foods, then we can avoid that process and look and feel better. That's right. All right. I got a question here from Kinsey who asks, during the 30-day reset, you mentioned that your goal is to stick to three meals a day. For moderate heart exercisers, is your goal to eat enough in your meals that you don't have to have pre- or post-workout snacks? So is three meals set in stone or does that vary as well? It, it's a good question. It's not set in stone, but, you know, I've found that, it, and I'll use myself as an example, I do Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu three to five times a week. I lift some weights and do some uh, gymnastics, and I've been able to fuel that degree of, of training very easily on three meals a day, oftentimes two meals a day. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm not doing a super hard Jiu-Jitsu session and I do it at like 10 a.m. in the morning, I may do that fasted, do a really big lunch, which then I take advantage of a fasted period. I take advantage of the post-workout enhanced insulin sensitivity. So I think it's pretty easy to do that. Like, and, uh, you know, if we've seen anything, this really 
high frequency of meal intake is itself a pro-inflammatory process. Uh, Walter Longo, who does some really fascinating research around fasting mimicking diets, mentioned a study where they had two groups of people. Uh, both of them were caloric restricted, which should impart some metabolic benefits. But what one of the groups basically ate every two hours, but calorie restricted. The other group ate three meals a day, calorie restricted. The people who ate every two hours, even though they were calorie restricted, and you would anticipate that you would see some metabolic benefits to this, it was a pro-inflammatory diet. And so I think that this is one of the things that we really need to pay attention to. It, it, and it's a barometer for how healthy we are metabolically. If you need to eat every two hours, then we have some problems with nutrient and fuel partitioning, both putting it away for storage and getting it back out for utilization. And now what you do to tackle that will, will vary a little bit. And for some people who are really sick, they maybe have some serious uh, uh, things like, uh, uh, you know, an autoimmune condition or some significant systemic inflammatory issues. They may need to eat a little bit more frequently because that's just their, their system is not going to deal with that stress. So, mm -hmm. you know, again, not writing anything in stone, not creating religious dogma out of any of this stuff. But I think we could make a really credible case that a well-functioning metabolism can run with two or three meals a day. And that should be more than, than adequate to make that happen. Right. Yeah. Okay. Tracy asks, are there things like, are things like fruit okay during the 30 day reset or do we need to be strict about the matrix? Oh, what? oh yeah. So I use the food matrix and this is funny. So, you know, boy, George, the, the pop uh -huh. star, uh -huh. of course. So, and, and this is kind of funny because he's gay and, and he, he said, Rob, I don't see, and he shot me a, a Twitter private message. He said, Hey, I don't see fruit in the, the, uh, the, Food matrix, and it's because you don't cook with fruit. That's the only reason why <laughs> fruit doesn't really pop up in the food matrix. So the right. food matrix is proteins, carbs, fats, spices, and in general, we just don't cook with fruit. Right. So that's why it's not really in the food matrix. But Good staying know. within your, your carb allotments, uh, you know, uh, there's absolutely no problem going with fruit. And, you know, this is some of the, the interesting stuff. Some people who... Um, certain GI issues, they find that they do poorly with fruit and other people who follow more, they see benefit from like a specific carbohydrate diet and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. They may do better with fruit than with starches. Right. And so there, you know, this is again where this stuff just, it's kind of crazy. You know, you, you need a really a nicely assorted toolbox to be able to tackle this stuff instead of really strict religious dogma around it. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. But that's a fantastic question. Yeah, it was a great question. And it has come up again from, from pop stars, no less. <laughs> from the pop stars. All right. Yeah. Sharon asks, what are your thoughts on using coconut flour and almond meal and their effect on insulin? You know, generally the effect on insulin is going to be pretty modest. Um, so here's the deal with the coconut flour and the almond meal. We never just eat coconut flour and almond meal. This is kind of like sugar as a basic item. People don't overeat sugar. People overeat sugar with other stuff. You mm -hmm. know, we stick flour and salt and fat and all these things together, and we end up with a hyperpalatable food. It's pretty easy to make some very wonderful um, low-carb, uh, you know, pancakes and waffles and all that type of stuff out of almond and, and coconut flour. And no problem with that, like, because I'm totally gluten intolerant. Those are really phenomenal options, but it's also pretty easy to get yourself in the deep end of the pool with regards to just overall consumption. Right. And all of that said, there is a little bit of a suggestion out there that when we look at the processing of foods, that that may be part of the problem that we see at the gut level. There's a paper that talks about acellular carbohydrates, carbohydrates that have been broken out of the cellular matrix that we would normally eat as part of whole plants that that refining may allow those nutrients to be absorbed specifically in the small intestine, starving the colon in the large intestine. And so it tends to migrate bacteria to the small intestine because that's where the, where the food is, where mm -hmm. the action is. Mm -hmm. So there may be some problems for some people with these refined flours, even these low carb flours. Yeah. And uh, again, it's kind of a situational deal. I probably have something like that once a week, once every two weeks, you know, we'll do some, gluten-free waffles or gluten-free pancakes and I, I tend to do a lower carb mix and then I do like some maple syrup and some butter on it and it's a, a fantastic
fantastic, you know, uh, uh, way to kick my heels up and have a little bit of fun on the weekend, but I don't do it every single day. Yeah. And kick your heels up is your way of reframing the cheat day. I don't like calling it cheat days <laughs> and treats. Right. Oh, God, I just hate all that stuff. Right, uh, right. Yeah. So yeah. it's for heel kicking up only. It's for heel kicking up and, and not treating and not cheating. Yeah. <laughs> and not treating yeah. and not cheating. Yeah. All right. So Keith Norris asks, if I do the 30-day reset and seven-day carb test, will I become even more of a Wolverine? Yes. Although that would be hard to do. Yes. yes, especially for Keith. For Keith. Especially for Keith, because he's pretty Wolverine. God. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Already. So um, I want to just give you a minute to let everybody know about your book and your podcast and your trip to Austin and tell us how much you love Paleo FX and, <laughs> and seeing oh, everybody here. <laughs> Paleo FX is the, the best party ever and uh, just really amazing people. Um, you know, I mean, it, it's uh, it's just been fascinating to watch the growth and development of the paleo movement in general, but particularly this uh, uh, marketplace of ideas that is paleo effects. You know, mm-hmm. people get to present what they're they're thinking about, and we get to compare and contrast and debate and argue. And what what's emerged over time are some really phenomenal best practices, and it's a, a sometimes messy, chaotic process, and it's awesome because we don't have a central authority or figure that is the sole arbiter of the truth. Right. That would be horrible because inevitably when that happens, we end up with the USDA and the FDA and, it, and it's a, it's a disaster. And so um, I'm really just a, a grateful for indebted to excited about the whole Palo FX uh, community and concept, because again, we get to get together and build those communities, build those connections, help each other with our, our businesses and our, our, you know, goals and aspirations. Um, you, you literally can't throw a rock and not hit somebody that, that, uh, you know, had a life altering process due to the whole paleo concept when you go to this event. So that's totally amazing. So yeah, I mean, I could, I could go on and on about how wonderful paleo FX is. And I mean, it's, Awesome food, great people, and uh, hopefully we have jujitsu mats again, so I can get. To yes, the jujitsu mats. I actually think we're going to have a couple of extra areas that Michelle and the team have been working on this year that we didn't have last year, just to nice. totally make nice. the experience even more epic. And I think we're, I think we're moving outside the Palmer even, and um, awesome. yeah, because we've we've taken up the entire center on the inside, so we're gonna we're gonna set some stuff outside and. Uh, we're expecting the event to sell out this year. As you guys know, Paleo FX has sold out the last four years or five years. So if you're wanting to come and join us in Austin, we would love to have you here. If you go to paleofx.com forward slash register, you can get your tickets. And today's the last day of the flash sale. So if you want to get your tickets on sale today, today's do it. Today's the day to do it. And then um, um, we will go back to normal ticket prices. And I believe ticket tickets are going to go up Um in April. So you want to make sure that you uh, put it on your calendar, put it in your budget and make plans to join us here in Austin. So, so Rob, where can people find you online? Well, I know we're going to tag your website and stuff um, in this post, but um, if people are wanting yeah, more information, uh, robwolf.com also wired to eat.com. And uh, that's where you can track down the, the information. We're generating a whole lot of support material for folks moving through this process. We're hoping to have both a, a very seamless ability to order your blood work that is in congruence with the way that the book is recommending, as well as a really slick way to um, track and monitor all the, the stuff that you're wanting to track as part of Wired to Eat. So we'll be rolling that out really soon. That's awesome. That's exciting. Yeah. So make sure you guys go find Rob on Facebook. We'll put all of his info um, in the, the comments here on this interview and to check out his website, make sure you get his book wired to eat. I have, I have Keith's copy here. Oh, nice. <laughs> yes. Fantastic book. I, I was devouring it the last couple of days and, uh, I just kind of, I love the way that you've taken a lot of these ideas and, and areas that we've been dancing around, you know, in the movement over the last few years and fused them together into a, a whole new program and way of, uh, assimilating all this information. Okay, we have one final question because we were talking about treats and cheats. Yeah. <laughs> so Benjamin asks for you to elaborate a little bit on treats and cheats. Why don't you like them? Oh man, so uh, 
uh, because we're dealing with the paleo crowd, I can get a little bit geeky on this. Yes, so geek out. Within, within evolutionary biology, there's a, and in primates, there's a sense of justice that is really, really profound within all primates. All primates get a sense of whether or not they're getting a good deal or a raw deal. People in the community recognize that, and not just people, but you know, other other critters. This is true of monkeys, chimpanzees, gorillas. And cheating is a really big deal within primate social structures. Uh, cheating an in individual is a really big deal, and it gets you socially censored, crushed, exercised, you know, all types of things. So the root meaning of to cheat is to gain unfair advantage on someone. Now, my question is, if you're eating paleo, if you're eating vegan, if you're eating macrobiotic, and you decide to eat something not in that plan, how are you gaining an unfair advantage on anyone? Right. It's ridiculous. Right. But what we've done is we... Now, humans should feel guilt about doing crappy things to the, their peer group because otherwise our society becomes chaos. So there's some kind of evolutionary wiring there where we legitimately should feel bad about cheating, about taking unfair advantage of, of other people. But when you inappropriate pl- apply the term cheat to something that is only a consequence-based deal, there's just outcomes to your food. There's not a moral imperative to it. And the, the thing that people miss is that if you want to have a meal that's not on the plan, then all you need to do to get back on the plan is the very next meal is on the plan. You right. Know, you know, or, or if you tend to turn this into a, uh, a moralized situation, then you just throw your hands up. And you're like, oh, I messed up once. I'm done. And you, you just bag the whole thing. So um, people who really fixate on that cheat idea inevitably have some emotional baggage around the stuff. I mean, it's just an if A, then B kind of, kind of deal. And, um, uh, so that, that's some of my thoughts on it. I, I, I could go deeper <laughs> if you want me to, but that, yeah. that's kind of the basic deal. And what I find is that if people can reframe this and uh, you, so another piece of this, people will say, okay, I'm going to have a cheat meal this Saturday. And so on Monday, they start planning it. And on Tuesday, they start outlining it. And on Wednesday, they're just whipped into a lather. And what this behavior is very similar to is what you see in drug addicts, particularly in heroin addicts, because <laughs> right. there's a whole kit. The heroin addict, when you talk to them, they will talk about getting out the box and opening it up and pulling out their elastic band to tie their arm off. And, you know, that anticipatory process is oftentimes as addictive and as stimulating as taking the drug itself. Right. So my problem with this, like, you know, going fully hookers and cocaine <laughs> cheat meal that you plan is that it creates a completely super normal stimuli. It raises you up so high and then you crash afterwards. Right. Inevitably. That is the result. It, you know, that's the inevitable outcome of these types of processes. So what do you want to do? You want to do it again because you want to feel good again. You want all that, that, you know, drama and the energy and the dopamine and all that stuff. So um, I really get people angry when I talk about this. It really pushes a lot of buttons. But when people are, you know, if you want to have something, have it. But let it pop up organically just the way that we do everything else. You right, know I mean? right. It, it, yeah, it, you know, if, if you're out at a – like I don't do any gluten. Like I, I try like hell just to avoid gluten contamination because the, the results are just horrible for me. Sure. But that said, you know, like if, uh, uh, you know, the other day I the book made New York Times bestseller and we went out to celebrate and I, I got a gluten free chocolate tort and that was great, you know, but I didn't bring the chocolate tort home. I didn't bring four bags of potato chips home. Because I would have eaten all that, it would have been a disaster. So, right. You know, there's also a little bit of, of planning that goes into that too. Right. Being intentional. Yeah. Well, yeah. well thank you so much, Rob. We're excited to see it's you in a couple of here. months. Yes. If you guys go get your Paleo FX tickets at paleofx.com forward slash register. Today's the last day of the flash sale, if I haven't mentioned that. And um, make sure that you like this and share this video. I would love for as many people as possible in our community to get the chance to hear from Rob and the things that he's been grokking on lately. So hey, and I'll throw one more thing out there. I'm going to hump folks knee. If you've read the book, if you enjoy it, even if you don't enjoy it, I, I, I like uh, uh, honest responses, but if you can go post a review, either Amazon, Barnes and Noble, right. or you purchase your book, that is huge for the success of, of the book over the long haul. So if I, 
thank you guys who have purchased the book. And if you, if I can hump your knee for one more favor, um, <laughs> go, go do a review on that. Please. Yeah, I'll do my review. I'll get my review awesome. in by the weekend. Awesome. awesome. All right. Well, thanks, Rob. Thanks everyone for joining us.